So we're studying in John chapter 9, the blind man, and we're going to look at what the blind man saw and try to get some lessons from, from what his experiences were and what we can take home from that. So I will, we'll just start right in because we're going to be ending at about 530 for the class, so we'll get started. First thing he saw was prejudice. When Jesus came by, they saw the blind man, and the first thing his apostles or disciples asked was, who sinned, this man or his parents? And so there was, they were already prejudging this man or his family based on his physical circumstances. So the blind man saw prejudice. We also see that he saw it from the Pharisees later on. They were talking to him and said, you were born in utter sin. Again, judging him based on his physical characteristics and not on any knowledge of who he was or what he had done. And so we see him seeing prejudice in his life. And this is nothing new. Job faced prejudice from his own friends. They were asking, they were trying to get him to admit to what he had done wrong because bad things don't happen to good people. That was what they believed. And so that was what they tried to convince Job of. And that's what the apostles and all the people felt about the blind man. And it's not new. Even today, when something bad happens, we try to figure out, well, what did they do to deserve this? And so we, we have prejudice in our own minds and in our own society and culture based on circumstances that may or may not be somebody's fault. And so we have to be careful of that. But what is it that we learn from the blind man? Well, he didn't let the prejudice against him affect his actions. Jesus told him what to do. He went and did it, even though his disciples had shown this prejudice. Did he sin or did his parents sin? He went and did it. And so he went and washed. He came back receiving his sight. And later on, even after all the things that had happened to him from his disciples, from the Pharisees, all their, he still believed in Jesus. It did not stop him from having faith in Jesus. And so that's one thing we can learn. And so when we think about the blind man and the prejudice that he saw, one of the applications that we can take away from this is we need to think about prejudice in our own lives. The first thing we need to think about is how do we react to it when others prejudge us and people are going to prejudge us. They're going to judge us because we're Christians or they're going to judge us because we don't do something they do. Maybe we don't drink or maybe we don't smoke or whatever it is. They're going to judge us. And how are we going to react? Sometimes the reaction is anger. We shut down. We lash out. But what did the blind man do? He didn't do that. He, he showed self-control. He showed steadfastness through this entire chapter. He maintained his faith, his belief that Jesus was a prophet, and he obeyed. And so we have to think about what it is that we're going to do when we face prejudice in our own life. But the, uh, the flip side of that is how do we interpret the situation of others? What are we going to learn from this story? Well, I think the first thing we need to learn is we don't need to prejudge people just based on physical circumstances. We, we need to look at them and evaluate them based on who they are, what we see about them, not just well, they look like this, or they dress like this. That doesn't tell us who they are. Their actions, their fruit tells us who they are. And so we need to think about it in those terms. And so what we see is we need to judge with understanding and compassion. We talk about judging people, and the first passage people go to is Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. And they say, we shouldn't judge anybody. But that's not what Jesus was trying to say there. And in John... He says, don't judge by appearances. Judge with righteous judgment. The disciples were judging by appearances. They were judging because he was blind. They weren't judging based on his actions. They were judging because he was blind. The Pharisees were judging because he was blind. So we need to judge righteous judgment. And again, there's a passage in James we're familiar with about showing partiality. And it's an example that can apply to people today. And we have to be really careful about that. So when we think about the blind man and the prejudice that he saw and how he reacted to it, that's a takeaway for us, how we deal with prejudice against us and how we control the prejudice we might have against others that, that we come in contact with. Any thoughts or comments?
Okay. So what else did the blind man see? He saw purpose. And you say, what, what is this? Well, when Jesus countered the response of the disciples, he said, it was not that this man sinned, but he was born blind so that the works of God could be displayed in him. And that seems somewhat harsh. We might think, why should somebody have to suffer a lifetime of blindness just so that God's miracles could be performed? And we might have the typical response of bitterness. We might refuse to accept what is offered. But when we look at the blind man, we don't see any evidence of bitterness. We don't see any evidence of why did I have to go through this just so you could perform a miracle and God could be glorified. What we see is that when Jesus said, go wash and be healed, he went and washed and was healed. And he maintained his story about who Jesus was as a prophet, his faith throughout this entire thing. And so not only that, we see that he accepts the fact that there was a purpose for his blindness. And he recognizes the uniqueness of his situation. He talks to the Pharisees later. Never has this been happening, that a blind man, born blind, was healed. And so he recognizes the significance of it, and he recognizes the sign. He said, this points to God. So he could have been bitter, but yet he chose to accept it and recognize something good can come from this. And it was good for Jesus, and it was good for the blind man. And so we see that he recognizes this. And so as the takeaway from this is we need to look at how do we react to hardship in our life. We had a great lesson this morning about facing suffering and hardship, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's like do we complain or do we get bitter? Or like the blind man, do we accept it and the good that may eventually come from it? Okay, James 1, we talked about this. The testing of our faith can, faith can produce steadfastness, and that can have good effects in our life. I don't remember if we hit this passage, but and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this passage doesn't say that all things are good. This passage says that good can come from all things. And so as we face hardships in our lives, we need to be able to recognize it can help us. It can build us up. It can make us better. And so we need to have this approach, you know, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full when we're facing challenges, when we're facing hardship? And I think what we see from the blind man is he recognized the purpose, he accepted it, and he took the glass half full approach to that. He, he did what Jesus asked and he maintained his faith throughout this, this episode. Thoughts or comments? Okay, so what else did the blind man see? He saw compassion. Jesus saw him and recognized that he was blind, and then he did something about it. He made an ointment. He anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and he told the man to go wash, and we see that the blind man's response to this compassion was he accepted it, and he obeyed what Jesus said. And so... He was instructed to wash his eyes, and he went and did it, and he was healed of his blindness. And so how do we respond to compassion in our lives? That's the lesson we need to think about in our own lives. When we think about the blind man, the blind man was in need of something. Jesus offered it, and he accepted it. But how do we respond to it? Sometimes we are quick to refuse the help that others may try to offer us, you know, whether it's a meal list, whether it's, you know, money, whatever the case may be, we tend to be quick to refuse things, but maybe it's because of pride. Okay. We live in a culture that is very much one of independence and self-sufficiency. And so we think I can do it myself and we don't want help from anybody else because we don't want to be dependent on somebody. The blind man wasn't like that. He recognized he needed help, and he accepted it. So how do we respond? It could be bitterness. We may recognize we need help, but we're so bitter about the circumstances we find ourselves in, we just wallow in it. You know? Or 
maybe we don't even recognize that we have the need. Maybe we're so consumed in other things, we don't recognize that we do need the help that others are willing to offer. And it may be that we don't need the help. Sometimes people are trying to offer help and we really don't need it. But this is where it gets real tricky because maybe the person that's offering the help needs to give it. How often do we think about that in our lives? And that's the difficult part for me. And it's the difficult part for a lot of people recognizing that it's not that I need it, but it's that they need to give it. And we need to be willing to allow that to happen so that they can benefit from what they're trying to do. Jesus said in, in verse four, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming when no one can work. People recognize there's things I need to do and if we don't allow them to do those for us, are we preventing them from working the works of Jesus? We need to ask ourselves that question. And so we need to think about that. And I think what Paul wrote to the church in Philippians is very interesting. Not that he sought the gift, but he sought the fruit that increased to their credit. He didn't need what the Philippians were sending, but they needed to send it. And he wanted them to be able to bear the fruit that came from helping. And so when we think about receiving compassion like the blind man, are we willing to accept it? when we need it? Or are we willing to accept it when others feel the need to give it? And that's something we all need to work on, myself included. And so, again, an application from what the blind man saw. He saw compassion. Thoughts or comments? I'm just going to say, I think from the standpoint of the person wanting to give, um, you know, that's one of those things that we should be trying to teach our children. got something that I can share with somebody, that's what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand the, the benefit that we gain from doing that. Not that we're not that we're going to go announce it on Facebook or anything, but just the satisfaction of helping somebody that yeah. may need something that I have to give. And, and then understanding the foundation of why we do that. Okay. Uh, for those on Zoom, Tom was making the comment about showing our children the need to give and the benefit that comes from giving and establishing that in in their lives and the foundation for that appreciate that <laughs> very good any other comments okay what else did the blind man see he saw confusion and denial after he was healed and he comes back, there are people looking around and saying, is this the man that was born blind? And some people said, yeah, it's him. And others said, no, it looks like him, but it not, isn't really him. And he's saying, it's me. Okay. There was a lot of uppy because blind people just weren't healed. It's like he said later, this has never been seen before that a man born blind was healed. And so there was a lot of confusion and a lot of denial. His friends, his neighbors were disagreement about whether it was him or not and it was something that they just couldn't accept it was it was new it was brand new for them but through all of this he kept to his story i am the man who was born blind jesus is the man who healed me he anointed my eyes i went and washed and now i see he maintained his consistency through all of that and so what i would say is we learned self-control the the impact of Jesus on our life may be very much the same. People may be confused about who we are now versus who we were, and they, they, they don't understand it. They, they can't figure it out, and they may start talking about us. We see the, the Pharisees are talking about the blind man. You're born in sin. This can't be. You're a, you, can't, you can't be right. They were denying all of this stuff. Same thing can happen to us as as we come into Christ, when Christ comes into our life, they may, they may talk about us and what we've become and try to slander us. Peter talks about that. They think it's strange that you don't do the stuff you used to do. He's not sitting and begging anymore because he's not blind anymore. We may not go out and do all the things that we did in the past because we've now turned over a new page in our life. We're living a different 
different life now. And so they talk about you, they malign you, they slander you, they do all these kind of things. So we have to, we have to have self-control just like the blind man. He kept to his story. He was consistent throughout this chapter, no matter who was saying anything about him. I'm the one who was born blind. Jesus is the one who healed me. And he must be a prophet from God. He kept to his story. He was consistent and he maintained his self-control. He didn't get pulled back into his former ways or, or give in to what they were trying to accuse him of or, 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 or how they were slandering. And so we have to do the same thing. We can be prepared for it. We can't change what other people are going to say or do about us when we try to take on a new life in Christ, but we can be prepared for it and we can maintain ourselves and, and cut, get strength from the others that are around us. And we can use what Peter wrote where he says, be self-controlled. The end of all things is at hand and keep loving one another earnestly because love covers the multitudes. Love will build us up and allow us as a group to withstand all of the things that come from outside, all the, all the confusion, all the slander, all the things that might try to tear us down. It can encourage us and build us up and help us to maintain that self-control. Thoughts or comments? Not only did he see the confusion and the denial of who he was, he saw division. He was taken to the religious leaders and they heard the words. They saw the signs that Jesus taught, but they couldn't agree that he was from God. We see this in this account. Some said he was from God. Some said he can't be from God because he broke the Sabbath. Others said, how can he do the signs if he if he's not from God. And so there was a division among the religious leaders about Jesus. And so we see that the blind man through the division of the people that were questioning him, again, maintained his story. I was blind, now I see this man is a prophet, okay? He was consistent in all of this. And so we need to recognize that there is gonna be division when people accept Christ, when Christ impacts our life, there's going to be division. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Father against mother or father against son, mother against daughter, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. There was going to be enemies from your own household. And I've seen this in, in my own travels in, you know, where families were divided because of what Christ did for people. One girl, teenager in Budapest, her family disowned her because she became a Christian. But through all the times I was able to visit and keep up with people in Budapest, she maintained her faith throughout those years that, that we knew of her. So division is going to happen. Strife is going to happen. But we need to be able to maintain our, our faith and maintain our position in all of that. But not only did he see division, we see, well, the application is endurance. The blind man maintained his faith throughout all of that. He said he was a prophet. He said this man were not from God. He couldn't do anything. And so, again, we see that the divisions are going to exist, and Jesus tells about it. And the, the idea is if we know that it's coming, we can be prepared for it. We can use each other as an encouragement to try to build ourselves up, to strengthen ourselves, to face the divisions and the strife that, come, that are going to go on around us. We also see that he saw fear and separation. The Jews had admitted that a sign had been performed. Now they're trying to backpedal. Say, well, he wasn't really blind. Okay, and so they're trying to figure out, can we discredit the miracle somehow? And so they trust the parents, and so they ask the parents, is this your son? Was he born blind? And they say, yep, he's our son. Yes, he was born blind, and we know that he can now see, but we really don't know how. And so the parents were afraid. So the parents wouldn't say anything about Jesus because they were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. And so to me, this is interesting. They won't admit to the miracle for fear of being cast out, even though it was their own son that received this miracle. It's hard for me to fathom that somebody would take a hands-off position from their own son 
who received a miracle of healing like this, but they were so afraid of the Jews and they were so fearful. And the blind man saw this, but even in spite of this, he maintained his faith. He kept to his story and they cast him out. He received the consequences that his parents weren't willing to, to, to live through. And so that's an example for us. We also see that, well, the application for this is love. How do we overcome fear? John writes to us about love in 1 John, and he writes that basically love cast out fear. The love of God that he has for us and the love that we have for God in our lives is what can cast out the fear that may motivate us to do things or to not do things. And so that's how we overcome the fear. And I think the blind man had this. He may not have known that's what it was, but he had it because he recognized who Jesus was as a prophet. And he, he did what he needed to do based on his understanding of who Jesus was. And so that's what we can, can do in our own lives. Look at God's love for us and allow that to help us to overcome the fear that we might have that may impact how we live our lives. Thoughts or comments? Okay. We also see that he saw stubbornness, and that's something we can all appreciate. The Pharisees recognized the miracle, but they said, give glory to God. They didn't want to give glory to Jesus, but they said, give glory to God. But yet they refused to acknowledge that Jesus was a prophet. And this is not the first time. The Pharisees have seen signs in the past, and yet they deny the miracle. They deny the power of Jesus. And we see that they're asking for him to repeat his story. They're trying to get him to change. And so they've already heard it once. They're asking him again. They're stubborn. They don't want to accept this. And so they're trying to figure out a way. Maybe he'll change his story. Maybe something will happen. But he sticks to his story. Okay. And so we have to, to recognize that he saw stubbornness. And we're going to see stubbornness in, in our reactions. Maybe, maybe we're trying to talk to somebody or maybe... You know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, family member that's doing that. Doesn't matter what it, we may see stubbornness in how we, we have to be patient. We have to stay with our faith, stay with what God has told us, like the blind man did. He also saw arrogance and pride. We see that they were reviling him. They were speaking down to him. They were ridiculing him. Well, you're a disciple of him, but we are Moses' disciples. You know, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but we don't know where this guy comes from. And so he responds, you know, you know, to, to that. But this is not just a first century problem. The Pharisees were arrogant. They were proud in their, in their knowledge of Moses. I have seen in my own life the same kinds of things where people were challenged. How dare you challenge a seasoned preacher? Well, seasoned preachers can make mistakes. Young people can make mistakes and so can old people. And so he saw this, this arrogance, but yet he maintains himself. He maintains his faith and he sticks with his story. But what we see is there is one little problem that starts to creep in and this is the only negative lesson that I want to pull from him, and that is his self-control. Even though he's holding on to his faith, we see a little frustration starting to creep into the blind man. I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Do you also want to become his disciple? I can hear the sarcasm as he's talking to them. Why, this is an amazing thing. You know, He's recognizing the power of Jesus, and yet they continue to ask him over and over and over again. They're stubborn. They don't want to believe it. They, want to, they don't want to accept it. And so he's starting to show a little frustration in some of the things he says, but he stops there, and he then presents some well-reasoned arguments for why Jesus was the problem. Nobody's ever been born blind and been healed. This man healed me. We know God doesn't hear sinners, but if somebody's righteous, he'll hear him. 
this man must be righteous. This man must be a prophet. Very well-reasoned argument. And so we have to think about our own frustrations as we're talking with people, as we're just living our lives. Be careful what we say because it's easy to stumble in what we say. The blind man was getting close to that, maybe, and I may be reading more of his words just from my own perspective, but he didn't go very far, and he came back and, and thought through what he said and gave a well-reasoned argument. So we have to be careful with what we say because it's easy to, to let the tongue go and just start speaking without thinking. Colossians 4, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The writer of Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. So that's the only slightly negative lesson that I would take away from the blind man is we have to be careful with what we say and not let the situation get the better of us. And it seems like he caught himself before it got too bad. What else did the blind man see? He saw Jesus. After he'd been cast out, Jesus sought out the blind man, found him, and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? The blind man recognizes the significance of this phrase. He says, well, who is he that I can believe in him? And Jesus says, well, I made the comment, perhaps his ears were being kept from me. He had already spoken with Jesus. Maybe he wasn't able to recognize the voice, or maybe it was just a very common sounding voice. We don't know. But Jesus tells him, you've seen him. And he uses the past tense, you have seen him. And what I would like to suggest is the blind man had seen Jesus more clearly while he was blind than most people can see when they have their eyes open. He recognized the miracle and his significance. He obeyed the voice of Jesus and he endured the difficulties that came afterwards and maintained his faith and kept it even though he didn't know who it was other than it must be a prophet because who can do a miracle like this? And so he saw Jesus. And so the application for us is we are like the blind man. We haven't physically seen Jesus, but we have the evidence, the written testimony of the writers of the scriptures. We had the physical testimony of the creation all around us. And so the question is, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to see in faith like the blind man and recognize who it is that's, that's talking to us and trying to get us to obey him? Or are we going to deny the evidence like the Pharisees? And so I wrote down 1 John 3, and the idea is we don't know what Jesus looks like yet, but we are going to see him as he is, just like the blind man saw him after the healing took place. We are eventually going to see Jesus, even though we are blind to him physically right now, we are going to see him. And so if we maintain our faith, if we maintain our steadfastness through all of this. And then finally, we see that he saw rejection. Throughout this entire account, the blind man saw rejection. His own friends and neighbors were rejecting that it was really him. His own parents were rejecting that it really happened. It wouldn't support him. The Pharisees were repeatedly rejecting him. And we see that the blind man endured. His faith could not change the rejection, though. And Jesus could not change the rejection. Jesus was talking with them, even up to the very end of this chapter. But yet they continued to reject him. And so the application for us is, how do we face rejection? And I wrote down here, our job is not to produce results, but to plant the seed. The rejection is on the result side of things. We're trying to get results. We're trying to get people to listen. We're trying to get people to turn. But we can't make that happen. Paul said, I planted Apollos water, but God gives the increase. We have to recognize our role and realize that not everybody's going to respond. The parable of the soils tells that. Only some soil will produce good fruit. And we have to recognize that and accept that. There will be rejection and we can't change it. But what we can do is count on God's strength to get us through it and recognize it's not us being rejected. It's God being rejected. And so that's my lesson for this evening. So are there any other comments or thoughts? Appreciate it.